Good morning. My name is Jaime San Martin. I'm coming from Chile. Um, the, the title of the talk is something like this, Powers of Green Potentials. Um, the, the main, the main uh, subject of today is to prove some invariance properties of green potentials. So essentially, we are going to consider the green potential. Uh, yes, I started without you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I... Professor Leons. <laughs> So I will speak in English because uh, my French is not that good enough. Yeah, it's good enough, but uh, you can also put it in English. So the, the standard green potential in dimension d, so this is going to be d bigger or equal to 3, is something of this type. <coughs> and, and that corresponds to well, that has many interpretations, but uh, for a probabilist, this will be essentially the, the time, the amount of time Brownian motion starting from X will visit a neighborhood of Y. Okay? So since the dimension is bigger or equal to 3, the, the Brownian motion is transient, and so the amount of time that will visit a certain neighborhood will be finite. And this is the density of that. <coughs> um, and I would like to study some uh, invariance properties of that in the sense of a function of this kernel. So when a function of this kernel is again a green kernel, which means that it's the potential of a, another Markov process. And for most of the talk, of course, f of z will be z to the power beta. <coughs> and there is some restrictions, of course, on beta because integrability uh, conditions. So beta will be between 1, of course, and d over d minus 2. Uh, in the case of the free kernel like that, this is the, the kernel for the whole RD. Uh, the result, the invariance result is well known, and they are called the risk potentials. They are written in a different way. They are written like that, uh, G alpha. And alpha is restricted to be between 0 and 2. <coughs> this goes back to Frotzman's thesis in, in the 30s, where he proved that this kernel gives rise to an operator that satisfies the complete maximum principle. And the ratio between alpha and beta is, is, is uh, immediate because you write and then you get what is the value of beta. <coughs> so the first part of the talk is, is concentrated to prove that uh, this new operator satisfies, the operator that has this kernel satisfies the complete maximum principle. Uh, Frostman proved use very much Fourier transform. So I would like to avoid that proof because I would like to prove a similar result when you cannot use Fourier transform. So I'm going to consider also an open set in RD and the associated green kernel, which is simply this thing. Uh. Okay, so that, that has the same interpretation, but now the process is Brown in motion, but you kill it when it exits the, the open set. So essentially, you have two types of trajectories from X to Y. 
the ones that goes from x to y without exiting the, the set, and the other trajectories that exit the set. And so you have to discount for them. This is why you have this formula. So this term is discounting the, the trajectories that get out. <coughs> uh, well, this, this is, uh, they give rise a, a, a nice operator, and it's the green potential operator on, on the domain. So it's the, it's the inverse of the Laplacian operator on that domain. Okay? <coughs> and we are going to also to consider beta powers of that. In this case, uh, this kernel is not a convolution kernel, so Fourier transform seems to be hopeless to prove that the operator associated to this kernel satisfies the complete maximum principle. I will explain what is the complete maximum principle in a minute. <clears throat> so the theorem should be something like that for any open set O, regular, regular for the Dirichlet problem, the operator given by this kernel acting in a nice uh, Banach space of functions, for example, that continues unbounded functions if the open set is bounded, is the potential of a failure semigroup. Which means that there is a nice process, like Brown motion, whose potential is exactly this operator. <clears throat> and at the end, we will see some simulations for a very special case. <clears throat> so, uh, to prove the absurd, you have to prove several technical conditions. And I will make a, a small parenthesis about matrices. Okay? <clears throat> if you have any questions, please interrupt me. Okay? Uh, so this is a matrix context. Sorry. <laughs> so what is the potential in matrix theory? Well, you have to first introduce what is an M matrix. <clears throat> an M matrix is, a, of course, a square matrix, M, which has some pattern some sign patterns, they, they, are, they have negative numbers outside the diagonal. And an extra hypothesis. You can write it many equivalent conditions, but one of them, which is very suitable for, for this talk, is that the inverse, so it's an invertible matrix, and the inverse is a non-negative matrix. Non-negative in the sense that the entries are non-negative, okay? They are also non-negative definite, but the important is they are non-negative. Uh, well, these matrices appear in many, many places. In, in applications in economy, in electrical networks, in Markov chains, we will see why they appear. <coughs> so, for example, a good example for an M matrix is something of this type. So, it's I minus P, and P is a non-negative matrix, P of 1 is less or equal to 1, so it's a substochastic matrix. And I'm going to assume that it's irreducible. Plus, I need, I need this matrix to be invertible, and that requires that this, the spectral radius of P, of P is small than 1. So, for example, P of 1 at some coordinate is strictly less than 1. 
From the probabilistic point of view, this means that the Markov chain associated with this kernel P is transient, <coughs> which means that at some point in this network, the process is losing mass. <coughs> and then uh, this matrix is invertible, and M minus 1 is just the sum of the powers of P. <coughs> so it's the old formula of the inverse of 1 minus x is the sum of the powers of x. <coughs> and if you look at, at this formula, it tells you that the ijth coordinate of u is the expected number of visits to j starting from i. So it's exactly the same interpretation, probabilistic interpretation, as the green potential in Rd, okay? <clears throat> well, um, one of the, one, one important problem in linear algebra is to characterize what matrices, non-negative matrices, have an inverse, which is an M matrix. This is called the inverse M matrix problem. <coughs> and of course, you can always say, I invert the matrix and I see the pattern, this pattern, OK? But they would like to know classes of matrices for which you have this result. <clears throat> and so we came to this problem many years ago, uh, studying uh, certain operators. Um, we proved a theorem, like 24 years ago, that we, if a matrix U is ultrametric, then it is a potential. And what does it mean ultrametric is defined in very simple terms. It verifies this inequality. So the entry uij is dominated from below from that. So essentially, u is like the inverse of an ultrametric distance. So it has the same shape as the, as the potential in dimension three, where the ring potential is the inverse of a distance. And this is the only other known case where the inverse of a distance generates another potential. And so we, we were trapped by this problem for many years. We work a lot on that. And <clears throat> we discover a nice, beautiful theorem from the 50s. We rediscover. It's a theorem of Choquet, Denis. That's the char completely characterized uh, potential matrices. And I'm certain that that theorem is not known in linear algebra. <coughs> and the theorem says that U, they allow non, they allow singular matrices. U is a potential, so it's a non-negative matrix, a potential, if and only if it satisfies the complete maximum principle, which says the following, U of X at coordinates I are less or equal to one, on those coordinates where XI is positive, so if you interpret u as an operator, x as a function, you say, I have a bound for u of x on the positive part of x, then I have a bound everywhere. Okay? So u of x is maximum where x is positive. <coughs> uh, the proof of that is not that hard, it's a long proof, but uh, 
it is nice. And so it's a, it gives you a, a tool for proving that something is a potential. And that com complete maximum principle is the same that you will see in Hunt's theorem for operators that I will talk about a little bit. The, the, list, the last part I would like to talk about matrices is that what's, what the stabilities, what, uh, what properties can you deduce from this complete maximum principle? Well, it is a hard principle. It's hard to, to handle. For example, if u and b are potential, then u plus b is not necessarily a potential. The same is true for the, for the standard matrix product. It's not a potential. The same is true for Hadamard product, which I will talk a little bit now. <coughs> So Hadamard product is entry-wise product, okay? Which is the same as the Hadamard product of series. And that will enter into the, into the talk. Because it was conjectured that the powers they preserve potential matrices for beta bigger or equal to one. And uh, we proved that like 10 years ago. So this is a theorem. U a potential, then it's a potential. <clears throat> and why is preserved by powers? Essentially, you, you need the convexity of the function and the homogeneity of the function is also crucial in the proof. <clears throat> and so once we prove that, we, we would like to understand. So a potential means it's a potential of a Markov chain. So you take the power, you have another Markov chain, and we would like to understand what is the connection between these two Markov chains, and we have no idea. Even for beta equal to, we have no idea. On the other side, in the, in the case of a Brownian motion, we have an explicit solution to that. <coughs> uh, what other functions preserve potentials that will be interesting to, to uh, put it in the context of Brownian motion? Well, we don't have many, many other we have a, a big theorem that characterizes the functions, but when you try to see if a particular function satisfies that conditions, it's extremely hard. Because it involves that the function should preserve certain determinants. Okay? So the, the structure of the inverse of that should be negative of diagonal, and that means that some determinants are sent to negative determinants. <coughs> We know that exponential also preserves, so e to the u is also potential. Of course, this, this cannot be used in three dimensions because when you take the, the exponential of the green kernel, you cannot integrate that. But in dimension two, you can because the green potential in dimension two is logarithmic. So the exponential will give you some powers. So there is, there is some hope to have, to use that theorem in dimension two. <coughs> just, just to say something, that uh, the function f of x, x plus x squared also preserves potentials. And that function is not homogeneous. Uh, <coughs> Uh, which means that if you sum the green kernel plus the square of the green kernel will be again a potential. <coughs> okay, I think it's enough for matrices. 
So once we proved the term, of course, we thought, okay, that should be true for the green potential in dimension d, bigger than or equal to three. But for 10 years, we have not been able to prove that. <coughs> Maybe we're slow. <laughs> there is one inequality that opens the, the solution finally. So we recently have proved the following theorem. So assume that U is a non-negative matrix. <coughs> I'm assuming that it's symmetric. So the theorem holds a little more than outside the symmetric world. Then U is a potential. U satisfies the complete maximum principle. If and only if we have a an inequality of this type. For all x, u of x minus 1 positive part times x is bigger or equal to 0. So you can, you can relate the complete maximum principle to a, some sort of a strict positive definiteness. And in one way, it's, it's simple. If u of x is less than 1 on the positive part of x, then this is 0 on the positive part of x. Then on the negative part, it has to be greater or equal to 0, but it's negative, so this thing has to be 0. So then you get the complete maximum principle. <clears throat> and the nice thing about this characterization is that it's stable for limits. If you approach an operator by matrices and you have enough domination, then you can pass this thing to the limit. So what about, what about then proving that g to the beta, the free green kernel in dimension d, satisfies the complete maximum principle. Well, you do the following. <clears throat> Yes. Uh, and you're taking the you're taking the Green's function. You said it's the inverse of the Laplace operator for which boundary condition? Uh, normally, you 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 do the the following. You put zero on the boundary conditions. So yes. So yeah, because I couldn't see the end of the formula. You you stop you stop. You stop when you. Yeah. So that's the end. So it's a yeah. So it's that's a, it's a, yeah. Okay. I'm assuming also that the the open set is regular. Huh? I'm assuming the open set is regular. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm going to use in the, in the proof, actually, that. So the thing is, uh, I will try to approximate Brownian motion by random walk, OK? So we are in RD, and you take a sum of independent random variables. Uh, for simplicity, I'm taking them to the simple random walk, which means that on the integers, you visit your neighborhood integer with equal probability, 1 over 2d. <coughs> and then you rescale this thing, <coughs> and the rescaling is something like that. So I'm assuming that the, these random values have mean 0 also. And so uh, that gives you a random walk. This criticization is n, a time t. And that converges weakly to Brownian motion. The convergence of every single variable is just the, the central limit theorem. Okay? But then you have to prove that this convergence holds in the space of continuous or right continuous functions. <coughs> and so you have a, you can compute the green potential associated to the random walk. The random walk is also transient in, our <coughs> in uh, dimension d. And so it's green function, which I will write in like that, n, also converge to the green function of the Brownian motion. Which means that for every function, you have a, a 
uniformly on compact sets. So at x converges to that uniformly on compact sets. And for that, you, you need more or less a good <laughs> domination of what is the matrix that appears here, because this is discrete. The green function is actually a, an infinite matrix. <coughs> OK, good enough. And then you can try to prove that this quantity also converge. So you can prove that. Uh, Sorry, it's not you anymore. Zn. But I will I will take the beta power of that, okay? Minus one. Also convert to well here is the, the inner product is uh, product in L2. And so you prove that this quantity is non-negative. Okay. Let me, let me uh, give you some indication of what one has to do. <clears throat> so we have an infinite matrix, and our result is only for finite matrices. Okay? But here's what, what happened. Uh, I'm assuming F is compactly supported. Okay? <clears throat> so if, if this is the support of F, so this is K, the support of F. Then the thing you can do is you surround that by a big box, a fixed big box. And then you look at what, what's happening with your uh, random walk. Well, the random walk is just a discretization of this thing, OK? <clears throat> and you do the following. I, I would like to restrict the random work to this box. So you define a new transition matrix, PIJ, which is inside the box here. It's just a standard random work. Okay? So move with equal probability to any of the neighbors. But when you are in a boundary point, then you let the random walk move. It will move. And sooner or later, with positive probability, it will come back. There's some probability, positive probability also, that never come back. This is why it's transient. So you define the transition from P to J in that way. Okay? So in the boundary, the probability of going from I to J is just the the first return for, for random walk from I to J. Okay? And that defines a nice kernel, T. It's super stochastic because the probability of never returning is positive. It's irreducible. So the matrix U equal I minus P inverse exists. It's a potential. It's actually the same as the potential for the random walk. So when you restrict a process to a smaller domain that way, you get the same potential. So the same number of visits to J from I for the random work or for this new random work are the same. <clears throat> the only thing is that you are missing all these intermediate states, but you are counting the same number of visits. So it's the same potential. And so you apply the theorems to this matrix. <coughs> so you have, in particular, that u to the power beta is again a potential, and u power beta satisfies this inequality. And then you pass to the limit. <coughs> the same thing can be done for a, for a domain. So the first part is already shown that G beta theta, which is the kernel given by, sorry, the Pareto given by this kernel, 
satisfies the complete maximum principle. So a big portion of Frostman's thesis was to prove the complete maximum principle for risk operators. <coughs> now this is very simple to prove. And uh, I will make a parenthesis to explain you a little bit the simulations that we are going to see at the end. So in the case, I will do the case D equals three. And in the notation of uh, RIS, alpha equal one. So what you get is a kernel. Uh, uh, so beta is equal to two of the standard green kernel, a constant divided by x minus y squared. <coughs> and if you, you would like to see this as the Fourier transform of something, and then playing a little bit with a Brownian motion, you see that if you take Brownian motion and you compose with a new process, an independent process, and then you manipulate the Laplace transform, then you will see <laughs> that you need Laplace transform of tau t equal to something of this type on lambda, e to the minus t lambda one half. And that's very well known as a process. It's called a subordinator, and I will explain a little more on, on, the, on the simulations. So you put all things together, you integrate, and you get that kernel. <coughs> and so you have an explicit process. What is this uh, B composed with tau t? Well, you run Brownian motion, and you see that as a different speed, but Tau t is a subordinator, which means that it's a Levy process, it's an increasing Levy process, has uh, independent increments. So this process is not continuous any longer. So it jumps very fast. But it stays sufficiently large time around the initial point such that this green kernel is much larger than the standard green kernel. So for y and x very close, it's much larger. But for y and x far away, it's much smaller. So it compensates in that way. <coughs> OK, once you have proof the complete maximum principle, then you say, what, what else I need for having a semigroup? Well, first, you construct the resolvent. associated to G beta O. And that's kind of algebraic in a sense, because once you have this operator acting in a nice Banach space, for example, if, if O is bounded, it will act on CB, continuous unbounded. So you have enough integrability to, do, to prove that. Actually, the image is contained in C0. <coughs> so the functions are zero at the boundary. And then uh, the resolvent is simply like that. Of course, you can prove that for a small lambda because this thing has to have norm less than one. Uh, but then you can extend it using the resolvent equation. Hmm? Essentially, this operator is always invertible because this is positive, in a sense, very strongly positive. <coughs> so you can construct the resolvent. All right. What happened next? Well, for the next step, uh, it's a little bit tricky because And there is, there is a class of functions that plays an important role in potential theory, called the supermedian functions. 
or superharmonic, I guess, in, in, in PDEs, which are functions, let's say, positive for the moment, that satisfy that inequality, okay? For some lambda or for all lambda is the same. <coughs> Why they are so important? Because then you can prove that for such a function, function, and for every x, this, fun this function is completely monotone. So it's the infinity, and the derivative change sign, which is the thing you need to have a Laplace transform. So it's completely monotone. So u lambda of f of x is the Laplace transform of something. And that's something you call PTF of x, OK? <clears throat> that's, that's very standard. This is the standard potential theory. And the fact that this uh, inequality is transferred on some monotonicity property of PT as a function of t is decreasing on t. <clears throat> and so that allows you to extend this thing up to what? Well, up to the closure of the supermedian functions. And so in general, when you read a, 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 a book or a paper about potential theory, you will see that they require to have this semigroup acting on continuous functions. They require that the, the image of C0 or CB is dense in C0. Why? Because the image of, of, of a function, a positive function by the, by the potential is always supermedian. This is a consequence of the resolvent equation. <coughs> but that's very hard to prove in general. So we were not able to prove that directly. But we prove something that is needed, that the supermedian inter that are continuous is dense in C0. And the way we prove that essentially use the fact that these kernels have a singularity on the diagonal. So when you, when you take a function, very concentrated around x, the image is much larger than the, f than the f image for another y. And so that separates points, and that's the only thing you need. <coughs> so you need a stone by stress theorem. <coughs> so we have that, and then you have a semigroup acting on continuous functions for which this potential is the potential associated to that. So we thought we have finished, but not. And let me show you a very complicated example. So you have a semigroup, that's, that's for, for sure, but there is a little problem at zero. The generator is compact. I don't know. Well, you should get, you have a, 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 a power singularity, so you should get all the, all the bounds for free. That, that will be very nice. Mm. <laughs> so you mean that G is compact? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. Uh, but something can happen at zero for the semigroup. So normally one thinks that P0 is identity, but in this context, it's not necessarily the, the identity. There are some tricky points. And let me show you an example where this can happen. It's not this, but similar. So you take a, a circle, and then you remove, or, or you, you designate a special line. So starting from one point outside of the line, you just run round in motion, okay? So it's, and if you reach the boundary, you kill it. <clears throat> but if a trajectory reaches first this line, then you do the following. You, you stop the process and you Reinjected in the space, let's say, in two particular points, that one and that one. You can do any, almost anything you want, okay? 
So as soon as it gets to the, this line, then it jumps with equal probability to here and here, and it starts again. So when you start from this line, P0 is not concentrated, it's not the delta, because it's concentrated in these two points. So P0 of x, singlet on x, is zero. It's not the delta function. And so you have a perfect semigroup. Uh, but then the, the consequence of not being the identity at zero has tremendous consequences on the semigroup. Uh, for example, is PT, the, the image of continuous functions are not necessarily continuous. Points like that are called branching process, branching points, sorry. <coughs> so we have to prove, since we don't have this property already proven, this is needed for both, for constructing the semigroup and to prove that the semigroup is failure, that it has this continuity. <coughs> So you have to prove that the branching point, essentially branching point is a point x, such that t0 x dot is not the delta at x, OK? And this is a measurable set. Hard to believe, but it's a measurable set. <coughs> so this set is empty. And again, the singularity at zero, the singularity on the diagonal plays an important role because it's much larger, the, the function at, at x, than in any other point. Okay. All right, then you have finished. <coughs> now there's uh, many things that we would like to, to see. This, this theorem has been Finish, I would say, last week. <laughs> uh, we would like to see how the process looks like. Uh, we, I, I think the process is not continuous. It has a discontinuous path. Uh, maybe that's quite simple, but I don't know. I would like to have an, an idea of what is the, gener the infinitesimal generator. It cannot be a, a differential operator has to be something very tricky. Probably has a differential part, but it has to have these long-range interactions. <clears throat> uh, why, why uh, I happen to say why uh, we care about this, oh, this is not working. there. Why we care about this uh, invariance uh, properties? Well, it's because some applications, we, we think that they are important in some applications. So if you work in statistics or in applied probability, normally you, you will have a model, a model for a Markov chain. But essentially, you always uh, put as a model your transition kernel. And that's very simple to model. You say it's a non-negative matrix. P of 1 is less or equal to 1. And then you try to fit from the data that matrix by observing the transitions on your, on your phenomena. There are some phenomena that you cannot measure these transitions. There is no way of measuring them. For example, <clears throat> if you have an electrical network, Pij, are related to the resistance of, of the individual parts of the network. And if you want to measure that, you have to take it out and measure it. But you can measure the voltage directly. And the voltage is exactly UIJ without disturbing the, the, the network. And you can think that as, I don't know, in a, in a traffic flow, you can measure the flow between different nodes regardless of where this car started and when it's going to stop. So there are some situations, you may think, that you can measure the potential much easier than the transition probabilities. And then estimate P by inverting this thing. 
So if you estimate u, you can estimate p. <coughs> the main problem with this is that what sort of models you will put over potentials. You would like, in general, to have a family of potentials to which I will estimate one. But this is very hard because determining when you have a family of potentials is not easy. So if, if you have a model, now we have a model that if you have a, a particular potential, and then you have a parameter, at least, to play with. And we would like to have bigger families of potentials and determined by parameters. Okay? Let me show you uh, what is the simulation here. <coughs> here you have uh, three graphs. On the left top, you have a standard Brownian motion, one dimensional. Then the subordinator on the, on the, below that is just something that is called the passage time. So it's the time the Brownian motion takes to passage some height. Okay, so you have a Brownian motion, and then you fix a height, and you, you take that time. Okay, so this is tau A. <clears throat> and you will see that this has some continuity, but when you, you reach to a maximum, then you have to wait a long time to, re, to, to cross that over. This, so this process is flat, as you can see in the simulation. And the process on the right-hand side is, is a process that has this green function 1 over norm of x square. So uh, blue is the standard brown motion. Red is the new process. And then you see also I, I, have, I have drawn some projections on the floor on, on some wall to see better. So, so the simulation is run in, in a speed 1 for the red process. Sometimes the brown motion has to catch up uh, a little bit. Some simulations are shorter than others. This one's very short. <laughs> because sometimes uh, I, I run this up, up to the time brown motion gets over 10. But sometimes that will take. So that has an infinite expectation. So it will take very long time to reach. As you can see, the process stays a little bit on the, on the place and the jumps. That's one. Yes, yeah, still running. Okay. Questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you.